we have uh, four speakers and two hours. So each each presentation will will be uh, 15 to 20 uh, minutes, and there will be a discussion at the end of the session. My rapporteur is uh, Charles Atacora from the FIG Young Surveyors uh, Network. Welcome, uh, Charles. And Charles will be, uh, let's say, managing your, your questions. And uh, please be aware that this session will be, will be recorded so that we can look back uh, later in time. Um, and now I can introduce to you my first speaker and good friend, Professor Peter van Oostholm from Delft University. Peter is a professor of GIS technology at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment. Uh, his chair concentrates on the spatial information infrastructure. Central point is the durable geo information that can be shared, reused, based on joint definitions of data sets and services. Peter manages the various scale geo information project and he is co editor of the ISO 19152 land administration domain model. The title of his presentation is uh, 3D and LADM land administration domain model edition two. So Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Crit. I will uh, start sharing my screen again. Yeah, this presentation is on behalf of a whole uh, team working on the revision of LRDM, including uh, yeah, the chairperson of this, uh, this session, but also uh, Abdullah Kara, Abdullah uh, Kalatas, Agun, Indreed, Eftegia Kalaghani, and Anna Schneidman, and uh, also uh, Peter Aukes, uh, which I forgot to mention here. Uh, I will focus uh, a little bit on the LRDM status and not explain too much, but uh, we are now in a revision. And after that, I will look into uh, the 3D aspects uh, of that revision. And I will split it into uh, the 3D cadaster, the 3D valuation, and the 3D spatial planning information. And if there is time, I will quickly uh, tell something about other aspects in uh, the revision of LRDM, such as the marine and the uh, 3D indoor. Uh, you may know this uh, definition uh, quite well of uh, land administration, and you see here ownership, uh, value, and use. But in LRDM version one, the current version, we only have uh, actually uh, the uh, ownership, uh, rights, restrictions, and responsibilities, and not really the value of uh, other land use. And here you can see a very quick impression, uh, an overview of uh, the main classes in LRDM. It's a conceptual model, uh, so not a technical model, not an encoding. It covers both the spatial and the uh, legal administrative part. Uh, looking at the spatial uh, part, uh, the key class is uh, LA spatial unit, and it has a number of specializations. Uh, legal space building units and legal space uh, network for utility networks. And there are different types of uh, geometric representations possible uh, with a single point, with text, unstructured lines, polygons, or uh, topology. And already in version one, 2D and 3D uh, are possible. Uh, why are we now at the revision? Uh, this is a kind of uh, normal procedure in, in ISO after uh, six years when the standard is being used. Uh, it is checked by the member states uh, if it is in use and if a revision is wanted. And this was uh, indeed the case. And there were a number of uh, events. Uh, the UNGGM uh, group, expert group on land management, uh, a number of LRDM workshops uh, that uh, scoped uh, the new uh, standards or the new version of the standard. In the meantime, we also had a number of ISO TC211 meetings. And the next one is planned to be uh, online the end of uh, this year. It's important to say that uh, LRDM uh, revision started with a stage zero project to gather all requirements from all participants uh, to see what should be uh, in the new version. And maybe you have seen this before. It will be a multi-part standard. And part one and part two are 
corresponding to the current version. So uh, fundamentals of, of the land administration model and the land registration. And new in scope are marine space, land valuation, and spatial planning information. And also very new is the implementation aspect. So not only a conceptual model, but also really uh, steps for implementations like uh, technical models, encoding schemas, and uh, methodology for developing uh, country profiles. And so we all know, uh, if you read the te textbooks well, uh, what uh, is land administration, land management, uh, to serve land management. You see on the left land tenure, and you see all the other aspects of value use, uh, planning, and development. Uh, and uh, the scope of LRDM version one is just basically the land tenure with all the RRRs. But the scope of uh, version two is now all these boxes, uh, you see all these important boxes uh, for land administration. For those of you not so familiar with uh, standard uh, development in ISO, uh, it has a number of stages. So it is uh, taking usually quite a long time, uh, you must think three to four years. Uh, last year we passed uh, stage zero and uh, earlier this month uh, we uh, got accepted the new work item proposal and the working draft for uh, part one the fundamentals and we are now busy with writing part two the land tenure and, uh, you see uh, part one is expected to be ready in september uh, uh, 2023 and the part two the three the four the five and the six will uh, follow hopefully now quickly to the 3D aspects. Uh, I really like 3D. Uh, it doesn't matter is it above uh, or is it below the surface? Is it in buildings or is it just uh, airspace? It's important. It matters to people. Yeah, so this was a uh, nice article in uh, the New York Times uh, from a year ago about say uh, 3D air parcel of value uh, 11 million US dollars. But there are many types, uh, some are related to uh, utilities below the surface or to the marine space or to archaeology or uh, yeah, uh, the majority to uh, uh, buildings and constructions where the rights are then uh, on top of each other and uh, intertwined. So it's rather a big challenge to introduce 3D in a world uh, where the 2D representations have been used for so many uh, decades or, or, or even centuries. So we need to be able to uh, yeah, reuse this uh, 2D and 3D representation uh, together. And in LRDM, uh, it was actually uh, already in version one covered that the 2D uh, parcels are actually 3D columns of space or imply 3D columns of space. And so perhaps the explicit representation may be 2D but in reality, the, they imply a 3D column of space. And here you see a number of types we identified in, in the first version. Uh, buildings, uh, mining areas, uh, tunnels. And we made a categorization of them uh, from, say, simple sliced uh, polygonal areas to really uh, more complex uh, shapes in 3D spaces for the different types of real world uh, cases. We developed uh, country profiles or sorry, spatial profiles uh, for the different types of 3D uh, models, uh, polygonal slices, so relatively easy. But you go back to also uh, 3D uh, legal spaces that are related to buildings or constructions. Uh, so this is kind of new. And so the legal boundaries can refer to physical boundaries uh, of these constructions. This is an example of a prototype we developed for an area in uh, Queensland, Australia, the city center of uh, Brisbane. With uh, only true uh, 3D parcels from uh, survey plans, yeah, so they're not, not fake, they are uh, reality, and we, we disseminate them uh, out of an LIDM uh, database. Uh, over the web via uh, a, a 3D interface. And you can click on any object and then uh, get uh, information. And you can also search by owner and then 
find the uh, parcels 2D and 3D of the owners. Okay, now let's move to valuation, one of the new uh, components. Uh, yeah, it's uh, one of the parts in, in land administration. And uh, at the moment, there is no internationally accepted information model that uh, defines the semantics uh, of the uh, property valuation information. That was also the case for, uh, say, uh, land tenure, uh, land registration. And I remember quite well when in 2002, uh, Chris and I and a few other persons started uh, the uh, standardization of land administration. People say it's impossible because all countries are different. And you can ask the same question for valuation. Uh, valuation is very different uh, in, in, in all the countries of the world. But still, uh, there is a need from the countries to have some international harmonization and yeah, uh, collect best practices. So here is the uh, proposed uh, model for the valuation information. Uh, these are the key classes. At the top, the, the valuation class with all input and output of the valuation, the, the, the method applied. We have the mass appraisal class that uh, documents uh, the characteristics of the mass appraisal. The core class is the valuation unit, uh, what is being valued. Uh, we can group uh, valuations in, uh, in, in groups. Uh, a spatial unit is one of the components uh, that is basically the land. But the other parts is the buildings or the units in the buildings that are evaluated. Important is the transaction price and the histories and the sales statistics. Uh, and of course, everything uh, is uh, based on uh, source information. 3D is very important for property, as you can imagine. Here, a whole list of reasons why. Uh, first of all, the 3D rights, but also view analysis, noise, hazard, crime, uh, insulation. Uh, they are all related. Uh, to the 3D location, even uh, distance uh, computations. So here you see a view shed computation for uh, one apartment building, but we show uh, two view sheds, one from the top floor, that is orange and yellow. And at uh, one level lower, uh, the view is different. It's just uh, the orange and the red. So you see less, so that is uh, not so nice. Uh, this is a specific profile, the 3D profile. Uh, perhaps you saw an, in the initial valuation model, no 3D information. Here is a 3D specialization of the valuation model. And this is a prototype for uh, disseminating uh, 3D uh, valuation information. Uh, you can click on uh, any apartment in a condominium and you get uh, the price. And uh, this has been developed by uh, Abdullah Kara from uh, Yildiz Technical University in, uh, in Istanbul, Turkey. 3D spatial planning. Uh, also, yeah, very important because planning and planning zones generate legal spaces, uh, same as uh, land registration, but they are in a very different world. Uh, people are different trained, they use different systems, they have different concepts, and it is very hard to use them together. However, they meet in reality. And so here we have an example, uh, a block surrounded by roads. Uh, there are some uh, ownership parcels. There are buildings of different types of, with different functions. And the different zones, so we have a commercial zone, we have a housing or residential zone. And then we have again the buildings and then we can check, okay, are there violations, uh, buildings too high or of an incorrect uh, type uh, according to the zonation. So to, after all the years, bring this together, uh, the column of the land registration, uh, land tenure, and the spatial planning uh, information, uh, spatial planning information package was developed, and you here see the uh, key uh, classes, spatial planning unit, spatial planning block, spatial planning group. And here are the, uh, the definitions as they are now in the uh, draft standard and to make uh, the whole information uh, related to land space and uh, legal aspects uh, complete uh, also in 3d and here you see also a prototype developed uh, this one is developed by uh, agun indrajit 
is from uh, Indonesia, but now doing a PhD in, uh, in Delft. Quickly to the last uh, aspects of, of uh, LRDM and indoor. In the new version of LRDM, we also look a lot at uh, indoor rights, uh, very important. For example, if you want to navigate, uh, which spaces am I allowed uh, to pass, to use? Uh, and that depends on the time of the day, on your role. Uh, are you a staff member or a visitor? As you can imagine. Uh, so for this, we combine LRDM and the Indoor GML uh, International Standard. And here you see the two models uh, combined together. So I'll go into detail. Uh, 3D Marine, yeah, also Marine is a new part of, uh, of LRDM version 2. And uh, you can imagine the marine space being a uh, very 3D uh, per definition. Uh, the water columns, uh, the sea floors with all the resources, uh, the use of the surface for recreation or uh, commercial shipping, uh, uh, the shoreline where it meets the land. And uh, IHO standard uh, S121, uh, Marine Limits and Boundary, is uh, basing uh, their model on uh, LRDM. And they want to further uh, develop this in uh, the future part uh, three uh, in LRDM. So here are some of their uh, class diagrams. No time to study them in detail, but here you see the inheritance from S121, uh, the ISO standard, uh, to the uh, ISO standard uh, LRDM. Okay, this was quick. Uh, there is much more which, which I cannot cover. And so we try to include support for the indicators for the sustainable development goals. We have a much refined uh, survey model. Uh, we want to enrich uh, semantically uh, the code list uh, we want to include processes as part of the implementation. Uh, we want to do the technical encodings. Uh, we want to correct all the errors we made in version one. And we want to make yeah, guidelines for implementations, uh, methodology for the country profile. So here you see the code list, semantically enriched with some techniques. Uh, there are a lot of organizations involved. It's not just ISO or, or FIG, but many other organizations. Uh, I will skip the conclusion. I hope you see what has been going on in uh, LRDM land. And uh, if you're interested in LRDM and 3D, then I invite you uh, hopefully to New York next year, uh, where uh, the next uh, FIG 3D cadastral workshop uh, will be organized. Uh, thanks for your attention. Looking forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for your comprehensive uh overview and and by the way impressive conclusions i'm, I'm happy that the slides will be uh, will be available at the FIG commission website uh, uh, i think from next week on as well as the recorded uh, sessions so thank you for your presentation on the importance of the integration of 2d and true 2d and 3d representations in in ladm and also the, the new functionalities when it is about valuation, taxation, and uh, spatial planning. A very important uh, development also for the profession. So thank you for this. Uh, our next presentation is by Dr. Mila Coeva, my colleague at the uh, ITC University of Twente. Uh, she is an assistant uh, professor over there. She's working in the domain uh, of 3D land information. And she holds a, a PhD uh, in that domain, a PhD in 3D modeling and architectural photogrammetry. Uh, and she holds this, uh, she had this degree from the uh, University of Arch Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy in Sofia, Bulgaria. So she's a real geodesist. Uh, and the title of our presentation is Artificial Intelligence and Virtual Reality in Land Administration. Mila, success with your thank presentation. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much, Krit. I would like to ask uh, Charlie or Rohan to share my slide. Yes. Yeah, sorry, just one moment, yeah. getting it back again. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay. You see now. I can see hope our um, attendance also can see the screen. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Greet. Um, please, next slide. I will start uh, with the motivation of our research. Uh, it was uh, already mentioned in some previous sessions in FAG today, or yesterday in some countries, uh, that among SDGs there is this target uh, 1.4, which aims for tenure security for all, with core rights uh, to ownership, basic services, etc. So this is kind of our inspiration and motivation. Uh, next slide. And also uh, having this in mind and having in mind that 70% uh, of land rights are not recorded. And especially in African countries, uh, some years ago, it was stated that it's only 3% the coverage. Um, we were highly motivated to solve this issue and to do something to record these land tenure rights. Next slide, please. Um, in Europe, many countries uh, have accurate digital cadaster in place. However, in African countries, um, have, they have limited financial responses and limited capacity to have such. Uh, and there is no time to waste uh, such resources and budget. So we were thinking how to use innovative technologies uh, to to develop a cheaper, uh, accurate, and um, fast solutions to record this land tenure uh, rights. Next slide, please. Uh, nowadays, with the increasing of the amount of geospatial data, also we say big data, there are many opportunities. Um, we have a variety of sensors that can be mounted on different platforms, such as satellites, airplanes, and unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, in the past, uh, and still in many countries, traditional surveying uh, or so-called direct methods um, is mainly used method for cadastral mapping. However, even being very precise, uh, it will require centuries to do that in African countries. Uh, therefore, following all the concepts for uh, fit for purpose land administration, we thought of investigating indirect methods, uh, or more particularly to use remotely sensed data. Um, and we started exploring innovative methods to extract features directly from the images. Next slide. So now I'm here to share a bit uh, about uh, innovative approaches about artificial intelligence with you. We are living in a time of um, technological changes. The technology is driving the changes. And the land administration domain is uh, definitely influenced by all these changes. Uh, with the technological development, we believe that uh, we can provide innovative solutions that can help to many disciplines like surveyors, engineers, architects, and planners. And um, data science and artificial intelligence can offer many possibilities to mainly interpret prop data properly, to learn from it, and to use it to achieve uh, special, specific goals and tasks. Um, in the last decade, artificial intelligence is everywhere around us. Uh, we have all these smart services like uh, for interaction, we have Siri, Alexa, we have um, driving services, developing uh, self-driving cars, we are shopping uh, via Amazon, Googling, searching, all this is uh, kind of uh, based on artificial intelligence. Uh, and you can see on the slide uh, also other uh, technological trends that, are, uh, that have been driven by the technological development. But uh, what is basically artificial intelligence and how can we link it with and how it can be beneficial for our land administration domain? Next slide, please. Uh, so artificial intelligence is one of the very hot topics nowadays, uh, together with digital twins. We have here some presentations today. 
uh, it is basically collecting data about the world and using the data to make predictions in short or long term. Um, there is no universal definition about this. Uh, on the slide, you can see some some of the definitions. Um, basically, it combines techniques uh, that enable computers to perform some intelligent actions and also in some cases to make decisions uh, which uh, is imitating the human behavior. Um, within artificial intelligence, there are also some uh, subsets like machine learning and deep learning which we find very promising for the land administration domain. Um, how? We are trying to, to use uh, these uh, techniques for extracting automatically features from our data. Um, so basically in the past uh, with our uh, surveying methods, we were mainly interested where is the boundary where we're measuring the boundary physically and sometimes even demarcating uh, but uh, with artificial intelligence and more particularly with machine learning techniques and algorithms we are trying to um, find what is in our data so what is a boundary among all the features that are visible on our images how has this been done based on many learning, uh, let's say, uh, approaches? You can see on the slide, I just listed some of the methods. We might have supervised learning uh, where we are giving some semantic information to the computer. So basically, in this case, we provide examples uh, to the algorithms in order to distinguish between the different features that uh, it has to extract. Uh, it can be also unsupervised learning, which is more uh, hard, where a computer doesn't have any examples and labels, so it basically extracts all variety of features. And also there can be other options like reinforcement learning, which is mainly used for robotics, where the computer has to take decisions and for gaming. Uh, to sum up, um, we were very enthusiastic to explore how this innovative concepts may um, be linked to our domain and help our domain of land administration um, to extract the data. Next um, slide, Rohan, please. Uh, apart from this extraction of data, there are also many advances in terms of data visualization. Uh, nowadays, we have so-called mixed reality uh, where we are merging, uh, merging real reality and virtual reality. From the examples of the slide, you can also see that there are very much powerful possibilities that technology can provide us for visualization. Uh, so I am looking forward how we can really use this uh, in land administration domain. This is some kind of a direction that we are also exploring. So to the end of my presentation, I would like to show you some examples from our experience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I will show you how we use the um, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence and more generally automatic methods in our practice. We started this uh, around 2016 where we explored in the beginning some already developed algorithms and among them, we selected Minshik segmentation, and um, we found out that it can really perform some pr promising results to extract boundaries from images. That time, we were using satellite data. Uh, afterwards, we uh, started uh, investigating object-based uh, methods, uh, and more particular with the e-cognition software. Uh, and I can show you some of our experiments. Next slide. Um, we investigated uh, how many are basically the real visible cadastral boundaries uh, in images and how much they can be extracted. Uh, those are the countries that we started exploring, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Guatemala, Ghana, Mozambique, Nepal, and Kenya. And you can see on the slide that uh, kind of between zero and 71%, uh, we had uh, extracted 
visible cadastro boundaries. And um, also we concluded that smallholder farms can have quite some potential compared to uh, large farms. Some uh, results can be seen on the next uh, slide. Yeah, I'll just short the next slide. Thank you. So this is one of the result uh, with um, uh, one of the algorithms uh, uh, in e-cognition. Next slide, please. Yes, this is another result just shortly to show you. Yeah, um, we can stay on this slide. So these were our very, very first um, experiments, but I want now to share with you um, the results also from a big project that finished this year. Uh, it's called, uh, it's for land project. It is Horizon 2020 project that lasted four years. It was a very big and interesting project uh, led by University of Twente and including eight partners from Europe and from Africa. Um, and our aim was exactly to create innovative tools to make uh, land rights mapping faster, cheaper, easier, and more responsible. We were focused in Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and at some point we also included Zanzibar. Uh, due to limitations in time, I will invite you to look uh, at this uh, video yourself where you can get more insights on our project. Uh, next slide, please. Today, I will show you just this part, which is related with uh, machine learning uh, and uh, automation and or most particularly semi-automatic uh, extraction of visible cadastral boundaries. So within this project, uh, the aim was to develop open source tools. Uh, and we developed uh, within the QGS plugin, um, machine learning based um, approach. You can see here the methodology. Mm, and uh, uh, the, the whole point was that uh, apart uh, from um, segmenting data and including automation, we also included interactive uh, part where the users can interact with the data and fine tune the final boundaries and concern them with experts before approving. Our results um, uh, are, were quite promising and you can see that we calculated that compared to manual digitization, the number of clicks per 100 meter was reduced uh, quite a lot up to 86 uh, percentage. On the next slide, there is also a video, we will not have time to look at it, but if you're interested, you can see the demo of the uh, plugin. It's completely open source. You can try it on your data. Uh, and uh, there is pretty well described uh, workflow, so you can try it. Next slide. Next slide, please. So here I just wanted to bring back again the idea the, of, of visible boundaries because we can we were thinking that in the beginning we can really extract only visible boundaries. Uh, how many? However, in many cases the delineation cannot be fully automatic, since uh, the extracted outline outlines actually require some legal adjudication and incorporation of local knowledge and human operators. So at some point, we started talking about extractable boundaries or candidate boundaries. So a bit we modified the concepts. On the next slide, you can see full information about our developments in terms of automatic uh, or semi-automatic um, feature extraction, boundary extraction, and all the publications. So if you are interested, please welcome to visit it. Next slide, please. Um, okay, this is the last um, uh, research that I want to introduce, uh, our last um, comparative research. Uh, in this one, uh, we have compared all the above mentioned methods and also we have developed a new uh, method based on deep uh, learning algorithms using uh, fully convolutional networks. On this slide, you can see that we have compared the methods on two different uh, case study areas in Rwanda. Uh, and we were using UAV images from two different uh, sensors. Uh, 
uh, the, the details of the flying um, parameters, you can see them on the slides, uh, the overlap, the flying height, uh, ground sample distance for the two areas and the tiles. So we can have selected uh, four tiles per each area, three for training, one for testing. And we can compare, we compare the results with the reference data, which were given by the um, uh, London cadaster. Next slide, please. You can see here visually the results. Uh, we have been focusing on urban and semi-urban areas, so it's very challenging to extract boundaries in such urban environment. Uh, um, however, we were quite happy that the results uh, can uh, even say, save 60 or 70 percent of the manual work for extracting uh, boundaries. Uh, on the next slide, you can see the final numerical results. Uh, so here you can see the comparison of all the methods I was uh, talking up to now. So the fully convolutional method that you see on the top uh, on the two different um, areas is quite outperforming compared to the global PB B method or multi-resolution segmentation method. Uh, so basically, we managed to extract between 60-70% of corrected uh, visible boundaries compared to the reference data. That is it from me. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward for your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Mila, for your, for your presentation on this very exciting uh, development. Maybe one, one issue for clarification, you, were, you had this table with uh, examples and tests from all over the world. And then yeah. you were talking uh, about the, uh, let's say, extraction of uh, between zero and 71% of fully visible boundaries. Yeah. So what exactly do you mean with fully visible boundaries? Is it, uh, let's say, the complete perimeter of the parcel or is it one individual complete boundary? Polygon. Complete, full, fully closed polygon. So if, if there is one tree partly over a boundary, then, then it does yeah. not count. Yeah, we didn't count it, yes. Yeah, that is a, yeah, maybe usually you are very optimistic and, and but I think in, in this case, you could have been a little bit more optimistic. So uh, thank you for this clarification and for yeah, your comprehensive you. uh, overview on what we can expect when it is about artificial intelligence and virtual uh, reality. But also good to see that, that there is a lot of attention to this automated feature extraction for cadastral uh, boundaries. Very, very promising. So congratulations with uh, this result. Uh, the next speaker is widely known, famous in Commission 7, Brent Jones. Uh, Brent oversees S3 Worldwide's strategic planning, business development and marketing activities for land records, cadastral surveying and land administration. Uh, as a recognized in the innovator, he specializes in modern existing land administration system and designing new GIS based cadastral management systems for small and large governments globally. He is a licensed uh, professional land surveyor and engineer. He is president-elect of Eurisa, recipient of the 2019 Eurisa Leadership Award, past president of the Geospatial Information and Technology Association, and current member of the UNGGIM uh, uh, Land Administration Expert uh, Group. The title of your presentation brand is uh, Geospatial Infrastructure, Enabling Land Administration Systems Modern Technology for Modern Cadastral and Valuation Systems. And I see on your title slide now, a summary of the it's, title. It's still, the, it's still the same, but I didn't want to put all that on the slide. Yeah, but I like this title too. What's new with spatial technology? So yeah. man, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Crit. And uh, Mila's presentation and Peter's presentation were excellent because what we do is we operationalize this wonderful research. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that uh, previously spoken that we've that have been op operationalized. Um, but I'm going to talk uh, about 
the entire uh, ecosystem. Uh, but before I get started, um, I'm not going to talk about the coronavirus today, uh, but what we've been focused on for so many months now at Esri is building out technology for this. You're, I'm sure you've seen the dashboards, maps, and models, and thanks to my colleagues who've been working around the clock on this. This is the time for GIS, and I'm proud to be part of Esri. Please take a screenshot or write this website down. This is where you can locate all the GIS data, models, and resources you need for planning and responding to the coronavirus. Also know that if you don't own the technology on the main page of this website that you can request assistance in free software. We're also, uh, software is also being made available freely to furloughed workers and students who may have to uh, study remotely from their schools and, and have a difficult time getting access to technology and also for nonprofit organizations working on this problem. Um, I'd like to point out that this Johns Hopkins dashboard has had over a trillion views. It's perhaps the most viewed map in world history. I need to do a little work to research that. What I wanna talk about is how geospatial infrastructure is transforming organizations. It involves many technologies, some that we, we heard earlier of, of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and it's all connected together using cloud computing, advanced analytics, AI, real-time data, sharing services, public in, publishing information through apps and a lot more. Think of this infrastructure as a set of building blocks for land administration systems. This works for fit for purpose and enterprise cadastral systems alike. Same infrastructure, just implemented differently. This geospatial infrastructure is changing what we do, how we do it, and how we think about solving problems. As we saw, drones, apps, high accuracy GPS, GOI, uh, machine learning, sharing authenticated authoritative data, and a lot more. This geospatial infrastructure is about modern GIS implementation patterns, leveraging services-based architecture and GIS portals. It can be configured to specific organizations, state and country needs. This can be pilots and projects, and it can be statute-driven enterprise systems. I don't wanna to dig too deeply into the weeds, but this concept is important to understand how modern systems are connected. Services or web services are how we connect data from their sources and share data without copying the data. We share data from the source. And because this geospatial infrastructure is wrapped in modern IT security with identities, like your Gmail or login or the thumbprint on your phone, you can control who does what with your data. You can manage who can view, who can query, who can edit, and there's feature level tracking so you know who exactly did what to the data. It's kind of a new type of accuracy. GIS uses all types of data. This is incredibly powerful, taking imagery, registry, mapping, 3D, IoT, LiDAR, BIM, and more. It normalizes it into this single system. So GIS consumes the data then it publishes it out in web services that power apps. We all know the desktop apps in GIS, uh, but this is where everything changes. We can access these services with mobile devices, simple viewers, story maps, dashboards. I wanna mention again that Johns Hopkins GIS coronavirus dashboard, over a trillion views. Let, let that sink in, all right? Think of the scalability of that being stood up in a matter of days and being viewed a trillion times. It's because it's so easy to understand. It's the same in land administration. These apps and dashboards can be configured and easily used by everyone. These apps bring a force multiplier to cadastral systems. Now this is kind of a messy diagram, but it shows data from all sources served into GIS and the apps that GIS enables. It's really a new way of thinking about how we share data and how we deliver capabilities, deliver understanding. 
This GIS infrastructure is incredibly powerful. I just wanna quickly say that you don't have to be a developer to build apps. In addition to field viewing and analytical apps, you can build and configure your own. These app builders enable you to build apps without programming. It's quite easy. These app builders are services, use services published out of GIS. Can you, can you see the pattern here? These services are key in modern systems. I can't stress this enough. You can go from project to project, system to system, country to country without software customization. Another key in land administration systems is the data that's available and the usable data. This is perhaps one key element that jumpstarts land systems more quickly than any other. All types of data, imagery, base maps, hydrography, topography, and much, much more. It's all part of this geospatial infrastructure. One very compelling element of this living atlas is that GIS users can contribute their data for everyone else to use. This is available globally. And of course, this data is delivered by services. You can turn on your GIS, configure an app, access imagery and data, and you're ready to go. You can configure a fit for purpose system in a matter of hours. Another key, oh, I thought I'd take a, a, a small tangent here and discuss how we actually build software. It's probably not what you think. We don't all get in a room and dream up cool stuff and then build it. We listen, we listen to real users, real requirements who are solving real problems. We use software development standards so we can scale what we develop and use it in other ways. We build software to be configurable so if it doesn't fit your workflows exactly, you can, fit, can configure it to fit your needs. That's it. We listen to the global community and build configurable, secure, scalable, standard-based systems. That's the only way software is sustainable. This is how we build enterprise server technology, ArcGIS Online, apps, desktop, everything. There are so many field land administration systems out there that haven't followed this simple process. It's one of the reasons why cadastral agencies and mapping agencies and surveyors worldwide have adopted GIS. We did this with Cadastro International in Columbia. We helped their team put together what we thought would work and there were gaps. We took, we took this info to our developers and they added core capabilities, not custom code that needs to be maintained, but part of a core system that's now available to the rest of the world. We're applying all this geospatial infrastructure to address the global land administration challenges from fit for purpose to enterprise countrywide cadastral systems. I'm gonna open this up a little bit and explain that ArcGIS is an enterprise platform. And that means that the core technology that supports your entire organization, it enables three key systems, system of record, system of insight, and system of engagement. This describes well the value of GIS in land administration. Parcels, ownership, cadastral mapping is the system of record. The system of insight is where you spend a lot of time looking for insights into your data. What's affecting value? Where are the property characteristics? The system of insight tells you what's going on out there. Using advanced models, spatial analytics like geographic weighted regression and Kriging, you can see the things in your data that you couldn't see otherwise and understand the impact of location. The system of engagement is how we communicate to landholders, taxpayers, stakeholders, and other departments. GIS provides a geospatial infrastructure to manage, analyze, share, and collaborate. We'll drill down into these a little bit so we can understand these capabilities. All successful land systems have these three components. The system of record is improved by the parcel fabric and efficient parcel management. The system of engagement helps improve public trust and confidence, transparency, and helps minimize office trips by taxpayers and land professionals. The system of insight with GIS enables new analytics, visualization, and dashboards. I don't have enough time to dig deeply into all of these, um, but it's important to know that these are core capabilities and require no software development. A parcel fabric is a purpose-built special data model to handle parcels and survey data the way surveyors would handle it. 
get a little animation here, okay? It's built into the system. It's configurable, so if you have different models and workflows, that's no problem. It's services-oriented architecture, so it fits into the entire geospatial infrastructure. Recently, we've embedded Dynajust, the popular open source least squares adjustment engine. I encourage you to give it a test drive and let us know what you think. This parcel fabric works across the entire platform. You can edit and adjust and manage data from the desktop. You can view and collect data in the field with mobile devices using external high accuracy GNSS. And you can use this data in other applications, simple web maps and dashboards. We're currently working on digital submissions. So if you have specific requirements around this, please let us know. All this leverages the world's largest collection of geographic data, the living atlas of the world. I'm gonna go to a couple case studies here and then I'll, then I'll wrap up. Uh, these are the requirements for the Columbian Cadaster. Uh, Cadaster International is leading the effort there. Uh, and if you were on this morning, Paula discussed this a bit. They needed it, this to happen fast. They wanted it to be standards based so it would interoperate with other systems. Of course, low cost, everybody wants low cost and high accuracy were required and no software development. They needed modern security. They wanted to use data they already had in other systems and avail from outside sources and use any mobile phone and not have to rebuild the system every so many years. It had to be scalable and easy to use. Because of the remoteness of many parts of the country, it had to work disconnected. Once they had a workflow put together, they wanted to be able to repeat it in all parts of the country. So we took a Trimble R1 and connected it mobile via Bluetooth. Note that many GPS outputs NMEA, which is a, it's a standard. And if you want to use a higher accuracy GPS, like, what, like whatever you want, it's the Bluetooth NMEA connection that, that the collector app uses. Leveraging base match from Liver, Living Atlas and configuring LADM services in ArcGIS Online, a complete solution was configured to meet Columbia's requirements. It's important to note that by following all kinds of technology open standards, configuring this solution, this solution is fast, expensive, inexpensive, and easy. Here are a few pictures of the process. I wanna restate how we build software. We listen to users, respond to real requirements. We had a lot of help here where the core software, the core solutions needed some new capabilities. Cadastro International and ITC helped us here a lot. I can't stress that enough how valuable it is to work with the users who help us fill the gaps in our solutions. Okay, here's how it all comes together. Comes together. Grab your phone, download the collector app, connect to your GPS with Bluetooth, just like connecting to a speaker. Connect the connect collector app to the LADM services you set up in ArcGIS Online, which are available publicly, and you're off and running. Your data can be used, analyzed, managed in ArcGIS, and then your system grows and scales to configure however you want it to. Note that you can use LADM, you can use the social tenure domain model, you can use whatever, whatever model you want. It's all standards based. Here's another example that Frank talked about a bit this morning from Cadasta. What Cadasta Foundation did was they took Esri technology and configured it to be a fit for purpose platform that they train and they deliver. Uh, this is Odisha, India, where they have, uh, they've done 50,000 land certificates. I think it's quite a bit by that, by uh, more than that now, but that's all using standard configured out of the box technology for this specific purpose. And if you haven't, there's, there's quite a few articles out on this as well as Columbia. And if you haven't seen those, uh, let me know and I'll get, I'll get you some copies of that because it's pretty interesting stuff. Now here's the other end of the spectrum. This is British Columbia, 2.6 million parcels. All that's, it's a, it's a large enterprise cadastral system using survey grade data. And it's managing all that survey data that is, happens to be electronically submitted and shared out to the entire province. The, the parcel fabric for British Columbia is the backbone of their cadastral system. And we have more information on that too, if, you're, if you want, but we only have so much time here. And 
I know it was fast, uh, but there's a lot going on and there's a lot that I didn't uh, leave out. It takes a long time to put these presentations together because we have to figure out exactly what we want to convey because we could be here for several hours to tell you all the things that are happening. But if the only things you take away from this presentation are that this geospatial infrastructure leverage leverages modern IT architecture, it's secure, secure, scalable, and configurable, and it works fit for purpose and enterprise countrywide cadastral systems and everything in between. There are apps, data, and services ready to go. And if that's what you take away, I'll have done my job. Uh, and thanks. Back to you, Crit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brent, for your fantastic overview. <laughs> really nice to to join. And, and also, I, I know from my own experience in, in Colombia that, that this cooperation is really, let's say, very, very well and uh, uh, organized and uh, very, very effective if it, the results that are available now for the, for the world. So <coughs> thank you for that. You also made this remark about the least squares adjustment functionality. That was just a one-liner, but I think <laughs> very important for the very important for, for our community. So I'm sure that uh, during the questions and answers, we will come back to, to that uh, little detail, which is uh, of utmost importance for, for surveyors, I would say. Yeah, a boss might know a bit about that too, because it originates out of a, out of Australia. It's quite a it's quite a robust uh, robust tool. Okay, thank you, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So thank you for for your uh, presentation. It was really fantastic. Uh, uh, of you, we leave the questions and answers to the uh, end of the session. So please use the the questions and answer uh, interface. Uh, to, and so that we can collect uh, uh, all your questions for the panel discussion at the end of this uh, session. I'm not sure, Brent, uh, maybe you need to unshare your... Ah, there you go. Uh, <coughs> our next speaker is uh, Professor Abbas Raja Bifat. He is the director for SDI and Land Administration at the University of Melbourne in Australia. I think he is, we know him since a long time. He is widely known. He's also chair of the academic network of the UN GGIM. Um, he is an international record, uh, internationally recognized scholar and land and geospatial engineer. He has led multiple projects in modernization of land administration system, 3D cadets and digital print platforms. Um, he has particularly worked, particularly worked with several governments in the Asia Pacific, Europe, North America and Latin America. So that is almost the whole world. Uh, the title of his presentation is Digital Twin and Advancement in 3D Urban Land Administration. Abbas, success with your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Crit, uh, uh, and hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and for sharing some of our lessons learned and also the project that we have. But before I start, can you see my screen? If someone can indicate that if you can yep, see looks my good. screen. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Looks thank good you. It. Thank you very much. I really yeah. appreciate the previous presentations by Peter, Mila, and also by our, I mean, uh, um, Jones, that they have already provided a very good foundation uh, for what I'm going to share with you now. In fact, uh, what we have just heard uh, from Esri, I think these are the foundations that definitely we need to have and understand how the technology would actually assist us in uh, bringing two things together and also responding to the needs of the uh, authorities and also the communities and facilitating the activities that we have. So uh, I would like to start by acknowledging our research team that have been uh, instrumental in uh, evolving this kind of technology, as well as also our no a number of industries that have contributed into this journey. And this is just to those that have actually been part of our activities for this presentation, the areas of modernization of the land system, and also with regard to the digital twin. 
So if you look at to the journey from the paper base to the digital twin, then we can see that uh, moving to the digital form to the three dimensional high definition live data set, indoor and outdoor, and then to digital twin. And I think this is the evolving, uh, perhaps, I mean, the, the, the continuum of work that we need to understand. And then we can see what are the elements that we need to um, borrow or integrate that to present. What Mila, she has presented and mentioned about the mixed realities and different forms of techniques that can be applied into our activities. So our research center also have been more focusing on a number of areas as a three dimensional uh, suite that uh, would facilitate the land modernization. And at the same time, we contribute into improving the resilience and also sustainable development goals. And in fact, due to the important roles that land and tenure, land, land tenure and ownership, and also management of the land actually play a role there. We are also providing a number of, again, solutions that would assist us to integrating different sources of information and then communicating with different forms that can provide, again, and facilitate the practitioners in the field. We're saying that let's actually look at to the, I mean, digital twin, which recently, again, this uh, started getting more momentum and growing very fast. And in fact, uh, there are different, again, definitions and also understanding around this. But the most important part is related to the, uh, what there are foundations or the principles for this. I actually borrowed one related to our jurisdiction here with the Australia and New Zealand Land Information Council, which last year have put together and we had the opportunity to be part of this, uh, to defining what we mean by digital twin. And this is about the highly advanced digital representation of the real world. So therefore, land related and people related information and foundations are the very important foundation for arriving into the digital twin and utilizing that as a a very perhaps I mean dynamic nature that we can do. When we look at today from three dimensional cadaster to the digital twin, then we can see from the real uh, world moving to the digital world to the fully digital twin and then uh, contributing to digital economy as a foundation. Therefore, it is very important to understand the steps from the two dimensional cadaster for accurate parcel fabric that we need to have into the three dimensional parcel fabric into the 3D digital cadaster. And then of course, then applying IoT and to arrive into the link data and then connected platform, then yes, we can look at to the return value proposition. And in fact, for those who have been very advanced into this, we also tested and arrived into this that any dollar investment actually would guarantee and return $3 return. And in fact, this is just for those who have already have a very mature system in place. But if you look at to the other areas that haven't actually been recorded yet, therefore they may actually have much more return value onto this. Now, having said that, and bringing that from to our practice, what we have gone through the journey, the pathways from three dimension, urban land administration to our digital twin. So from the 2D cadaster into the digital model, into the data validation rules and foundation, into the data integration, integrating with series of elements and applying that into the practice, as well as also about the data queries and analysis, applying to that and into the digital twin, which would facilitate modeling, forecasting, simulation, and series of other type of elements. Now, let me take you through a number of uh, I mean, specific lenses in this project, and also the group that uh, have been working on this as well. So if you look at the data validation process, because of the current two-dimensional representation in many jurisdictions, and applying into that, into the three-dimensional models into the legal and physical object and integrating that, which would bring us, again, new opportunity because we're dealing with a, a very complex environment, but therefore we need to look at to the examinations of this 
around three different uh, aspects. One is coming to the regulatory principles, one into the internal spatial consistency principle, and the other one is the external spatial consistency principles. And there are, I mean, foundations as well as also publication, which you are uh, very welcome to visiting our website to accessing those detailed publication, which each of these snapshots that I'm presenting today would actually providing you with the more detail that you like. We also have formulated the watertight concept for cadaster, and this is related to the extent of ownership in a three-dimensional representation of the cadaster, which need to be accurately defined and geometrically also closed. So therefore, we need to understand this, and also a primitive uh, three-dimensional misclosure, uh, misclosure checked. So this is again another dimension that need to be addressed into these elements. The other aspects of this work is about the three dimension data integration for urban land administration. We have a team that have been working with Victorian government and also uh, with the parties as part of our research uh, and development uh, project uh, with, uh, with them and also the funded from the Australian Council and Victorian governments and a number of industries like city council into this. We look at to the series of elements when we look at to the particularly adopting from the IFC beam and also LADM to managing physical and legal dimensions and also mapping the LADM concept into the IFC and then integrating that fund with also elements related to the, I mean, extending that LADM with the IFC physical object. And I think that is the part that then again, providing more flexibility to be able to adopting into different jurisdictions. So identifying the IFC entities and also for mapping each of the LADM concept itself. And also we have uh, put together and proposed the attributes of each of these LADM concept to be modeled as, I mean, again, the property sets and applied. So a special units that we have applied into this and also what again I can actually just uh, identify are related to the unit itself as well as also into the boundaries entities in IFC beam. So therefore we have expanded the solution here and also data model that would assist into the adaptation of the standard and also again the areas that uh, Peter has gone into the detail of this. The next one when we look at to the special query and analysis for 3D urban land administration. When we look at to the problems of using file-based approach, for example, IFC, and for the performance of the three-dimensional spatial analysis into the urban land administration, then we can see a number of objectives or areas that actually need to be uh, worked out. So again, we need to look at to the additional tools that are needed, for example, for extracting a subset of models or there are also requirements for tracking the changes, I mean, in histories and also about the, any type of difficulties or data uh, as well. So therefore, when we go through these areas, then we can look at to the three-dimensional database, which can solve many of these elements as well. So into this, then we look at to the new method for modeling legal spaces of properties which is surrounded by a number of complex building elements. These are just uh, some examples about the oblique as well as also curb walls or the sores and also the roof. So we can see that there are a number of elements that requires a deep understanding and also mapping on this. So therefore we have developed a database <coughs> schema for mapping the beam data into the 3D special enabled land administration database. And by doing that fund, we also proposed a new process for creating an IFC-based three-dimensional special database, which would facilitate the adaptation of this. And then we've gone through the plugin. We have developed a plugin for retrieving this type of boundaries using topological relationship between the legal space and also building elements. And I will showcase at the end that we have then uh, brought all together to integrating into, uh, for example, the work that we have done with Victorian government 
for the digital twin and apply all of these elements together and how efficient then that can be uh, perhaps offered to the communities. The other lens that we have uh, been working on is beam driven urban land admin for the property dispute resolutions. This is in particular because of the increase into the number of cases into the related to the building subdivisions. And it's interesting, uh, and again, you can see the, also the detail of this uh, from the publication that we have gone through. <clears throat> Just in our jurisdiction here in Victoria, you can see 21% of the cases that have been actually, again, went to the tribunal actually for addressing are around the, again, the dispute related to the ownership as well as also again, multi-owned building. So that means the design of the buildings, there are a number of things that we can learn from this and adopting the beam and also urban land admin system to resolving that and arriving into a better, uh, perhaps I mean the architecture design or a specification requirements for this. So again, uh, from the current 2D into the, multi-owned building subdivision. There are a number of also, again, domains that need to be addressed and assessed from the ownership uh, boundaries, as well as also uh, authorities, large owners associates, as well as also building structures, a specification. So there are a number of elements that need to be looked at, and then we can look in to see that how best we can integrate this to minimizing the disputes incident that actually would happen. So we have developed uh, a BIM-based framework for checking these MOP subdivisions from the architecture plan and cadastral plan into this framework with the BIM data of the MOP itself, as well as also integrating that one for detecting dispute triggers in cadastral plan. So therefore, by adaptation, and we have also uh, utilize the machine learning techniques here and apply it into the number of cases that we have received from Victorian governments into that to testing and arriving and identifying those triggers and therefore uh, coming up with the plans which would minimize and also remove those dispute triggers. Therefore, by creating this and checking the indicator, I mean, this is another again automating the process uh, for the rule-based checking for indicators, again, into the cadastral plan using beam data. So you can see that, again, we have applied in a number of elements into the practice to see what are the elements we need to actually adopt and work on that. Another dimension here is related to the 3D underground. And I think this is, again, very important aspects of the work related to the uh, assets undergrounds that need to be, again, registered and interaction between those and as well as also, again, the objects and the land boundaries, which would be requires this. And what you can see here, a number of challenges that uh, we are facing. I mean, any jurisdiction you go, you see similarities. And this is just some example that I'm going through <clears throat> that our team have actually, again, identified with the also from the cost, I mean, which is impacted on this, as well as a number of also elements that being address. This is, uh, that was uh, from uh, Melbourne, for example, and this is now from U US, for example, and again, the impact of this into the economy of that. And then we can see that there are, again, challenges that we need to understand from the complexity of the objects surrounding on this, uh, as well as also overlapping and boundary disputes around the elements because of, again, different authorities actually managing this elements uh, with the different specification and standard, as well as accessibility to information, intersections, and also data acquisition and validation, data sharing, duplication, and <clears throat> also security, <clears throat> excuse me, integration, and also the standard. And I think this is why it's very important we look at to the standards and also, again, adopting those from the elements that we want to work on this. By adaptation of this, what we have gone through and arrive into that, I'm very pleased to see the progress today <clears throat> the, that the team have been working on with a number of, again, elements and adaptation of the other components that we have uh, developed uh, over the last few years. 
and bringing all together to addressing from the physical data into the legal data. And then we look at to the integration of those. By saying this, what I would like now to uh, quickly sharing with you the project that we have gone through with Victorian government and also over 20 departments, I mean, in Victoria that have uh, been part of this uh, uh, project, uh, which is the Fisherman's Bend, which is going to be a technological hub of Victoria and also the plan that governments actually have for that and Melbourne University going to be co-located into this area and work. Let me, this is a, just a small uh, video, just showcasing some of the elements and then I'll also share with you the areas. In this project, we have managed to get over 1,200 data sets I mean, I captured from over 20 departments into the system. So you can see the richness of the system <clears throat> with the 1,200 data set. We have a live data feed into the system from a number of agencies and also utilities into this online series of models and in particular the three-dimensional cadastre linked into the land registering system through the lens and this is a project that now we are very proud of in this journey because now we have a more deep understanding of the lens as well as also the same. <coughs> uh, also we have identified over So Digital Twin is about the enterprise solution, uh, which is web-based, as well as also a number of portability devices capabilities, which provided into the system. And as you can see, again, the series of capabilities which we have integrated into the system from the validation rules into the query rules, as well as also applying a number of, again, uh, urban analytics around that, the sensor net for data integration, real-time data into this BIM-based 3D cadastre query and visualization. And also, we, in particular, what you can see, a number of also elements here. Let me activate it. So what you can actually see here, the number of elements that have been integrated into the system, which you can again, interact with the system, measure, monitor, audit, and also going to the 3D cadastre. And we have applied this one into the details of this and any type of building per, for getting the permissions or for the examining that fund, as well as also a number of applications, for example, from the banks that they have provided the uh, I mean, lending money into their owners and identifying those elements, bringing each of the floor as a sliding floor out, examining that from returning back into the system with a fully, again, uh, 3D cadastre, applying uh, beam into the 3D, into the, I mean, cadastre and integrating that fund with the ownership as well as complexity around that. And I think these are the really the part 
that again, by 3D query and search, we can actually get onto this. I would like just to stop here and I would like again to thanking the opportunity that uh, you provided to us to sharing with this. If anyone interested to learn more about this, you are most welcome to visiting us or contacting mm -hmm. us and you have the I mean, address below. Thank you. Well, thank you Abbas for this fascinating overview. <laughs> Very, very nice Thank managed in, uh, to, to give a presentation with such an information density in, in, in 20 minutes. So thank you for that, really. I enjoyed thank it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great. Yeah, you were talking about uh, watertight concepts for Cadesta. That, that is, uh, I never heard it like that before. And also this uh, IFC BIM and uh, LDM integration and, and more in general about physical and legal, uh, let's say, boundaries. That is a subject that appears in, in, in many places. And uh, let's say also this BIM driven land administration for dispute resolution. <laughs> really fantastic. So uh, I think we will come back to that in the discussion that will uh, follow now, the panel uh, discussion. So the attendees, I would like to invite you to uh, bring your questions to the question and answer interface. Uh, Charles, do, do we have questions so far? Yes, we have just a question from Shiraz Asan. Yeah. Should I read it out? Yeah, please read it, uh, Charles. Okay, so her question was actually directed to um, Dr. Mila. As regards the um, incidents where we have legal and physical boundaries, they are very different and how feasible are this automated boundaries delineation? Oh, that is a most interesting uh, subject and, and, and a good follow-up of <laughs> the presentation by Abbas. Mila, can you respond yes, to this? Yes, um, yeah, my response is um, you're completely right. Cadaster is quite a complicated system and uh, usually there are quite uh, differences between physical and legal boundaries. Um, however, in our research, my, our particular research in all the projects that uh, I have shown, uh, our main focus was really on the physical boundaries. So we were aiming of uh, extracting the contours, delineating the contours uh, as possible close, as uh, Creed was mentioning. This was in the beginning our first ambition, but uh, later we have also some parts of the boundaries. And the, the whole point was that uh, uh, after extracting those contours, it is in the hand of the specialist, the experts, to uh, further um, approve and to continue with the legal part of the cadaster. This was not part of our aim, part of our research. And we were usually giving these tasks to the local community, local experts to further uh, follow the process um, of those boundary registrations and cadaster registration. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mila. Uh, maybe I, I can add a little bit uh, Sharon okay. uh, from, from, from Pakistan, I think. So thanks, thanks for your question. Uh, yeah, that is a nice discussion. Let's say in, in what you see in many countries, maybe not so much in Pakistan, that, that the cadaster is very incomplete. And I think this, uh, this automated feature extraction for cadastral boundaries is uh, very promising for the future. It is based on the concept of visible boundaries as explained in this fit for purpose land administration approach. And uh, of course we had in mind uh, the general boundaries as we can, as we know them from, from the United Kingdom. And, uh, so we, we think that this is a very good step in the first step in the development of a, uh, of a cadaster. So you can start with this uh, uh, maybe less accurate uh, uh, boundary approach uh, where you can identify cadastral objects. I mean, it is very clear who is owning which object. And then maybe as a second step, you can, you can include uh, more, more accurate uh, boundaries. 
And all this depends, of course, on the on the value of the of the parcel. Uh, Charles, Charles, do we have more questions? Yes, there's another one. Um, how the registering has been made by systematically or by step? I don't really get that, but I don't know who that is directed to. But the person was like, how is the registering being done systematically or by step? Adama, could you, I think you did, did pose this question. Could you maybe a little bit more explicit? Exactly. Yeah, I can explain a little bit how some, some people view how this works is systematically you would go like Rwanda and go across the country. And other, and other ways to register land is you registered upon the, the following transaction or when you need to oh, survey off a lot or do some things like that. So what's, are they going through and registering all properties or are they doing it uh, ad hoc over time? I think yeah, that might be the really question. Uh, you mean sporadically? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so do you? Based upon need. Yeah, I think if I also add into that what uh, Brent has mentioned, it is really also depending to the maturity of the land system and recording in each jurisdiction. And then depending to that, they can actually look at to the upgrading entire, again, jurisdictions going for a systematic or they're going to just uh, improving as they go further, depending to the ownership and interest around each particular property. Yeah. And then they can select the approach into this. Yeah, I think it is a it is a matter of uh, capacity, time, yeah, uh, quality, and Budget. money yeah. and money. Yeah. So thank you for this. Uh, yeah, maybe I can ask a question to the first speaker, Peter van Oostrom. Uh, I I think uh, let's say this LDM edition too that uh, there could be a lot of cooperation and input from. Uh, from our federation uh, with members from all over the world. So could you, could you tell us uh, about uh, the um, link between the development of the edition two of LDM and uh, uh, our FIG? Yeah, Chris, thanks. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, if you look at the, at the parts of the LDM uh, edition two, and uh, you can already recognize some of the names of uh, the FIG uh, commissions. And uh, Commission 7 is, of course, uh, then uh, part 1 slash 2. Uh, but uh, yeah, the other parts are very well uh, yeah, covered by uh, other uh, FIG commissions, like uh, Commission 9 for the, uh, the, the valuation. And uh, yeah, the marine space, uh, I think it's Commission 5, if I remember well, I don't know the number so well. Uh, so uh, personally, uh, I think it would be nice if uh, in uh, the development of each of the parts, uh, FIG would be represented uh, by uh, these commissions uh, that are uh, having expertise. And I think in yeah, many domains also uh, other organizations and of course the countries uh, from the, uh, the ISO members would, uh, but also other organizations like IHO in the marine and uh, valuers in, in, in the valuation uh, group. So that, that is the, the big puzzle, but for sure. Uh, and somehow uh, LRDM was initiated within FIG. And so it, it, it is FIG legis uh, legisly. Uh, we, we have a re responsibility as, as FIG, uh, even if uh, uh, it, it's now growing and uh, uh, perhaps IHO is, is really uh, more into the marine environment than, than, than FIG, uh, but, but still uh, given the history, uh, FIG should have a uh, yeah, part of the, the development, uh, should be involved, uh, should contribute with the expertise. I hope it's clear, Chris. Yeah, okay, thank I you. I asked a question to, uh, to Abbas. Yes, ah, okay. No? Good. Uh, yeah, Abbas, uh, yeah, uh, it's a super full presentation with a lot of content. Uh, I want yeah. to listen very carefully. And by the way, that was true for also the other presentations. Uh, but Abbas, I had two specific questions for you. 
Uh, one is uh, yeah, when an, an architect is, is drawing a, a BIM IFC file, uh, I think he must have in mind uh, the future properties, uh, what will be the apartments or the, the shops uh, or the shopping units. Uh, could we not make instructions for uh, architects uh, that they already draw these 3D parcels uh, explicitly? If you see how complicated uh, the, the BIM IFC models are, uh, then it's perhaps 1%, 2% more. Uh, and yeah, that would be super efficient. What's your experience from Victoria? Look, Peter, that's a very, very good point that you have just raised. And I'm also, again, sorry that I had to put uh, too many items at the same time to presenting, but I just wanted to representing the team that have been uh, investigating into this. And uh, in particular, there are different work packages that we have been trying to address uh, in close collaboration with uh, our clients and with our also practitioners in the field, uh, which what you just raised, uh, in fact, uh, with regard to the 3D, again, adaptation of some of the properties into this, uh, because of, again, clients like city council, that they require series of uh, land use and also series of guidelines that they have in compared to land registry type office, I mean, land title office, which have a very different, again, uh, dimensions requirements. So therefore, we started to tackling some of those elements that in particular for some of those specific clients. And also at the same time for us to understand the, again, to uh, get better understanding the complexity, as well as also how far we can go. You're right, I mean, some of the items may not be realized in or expected actually for every jurisdiction to get into. However, if we go through this and for some particularly very expensive areas and very dense areas, particularly like the areas as, uh, which you need to have for underground cities or areas that you want to adopt in cities of element, therefore you require to understand those complexities better. What we have also gone through as an experience over the last about, I mean, three, four years, <clears throat> we have also adopted uh, new dimensions here and the level of processes that we have worked out and tested through the market. And we put together a book that uh, late last year actually published by Taylor and Francis. And we launched that from early this year, just before the lockdown. And in that, we already actually documented every elements of our, again, the processes. So I think into that, you can see the detailed examinations, a number of cases that we had to go through this to understand the complexity and also to see how we can really adopting that and then formulating this. And of course, some of those items, Peter, for example, for adding into the standard actually, again, requires further examination to formulating this to become again as an uh, again additional elements if any jurisdiction is going to that level of uh, advancement to record. And for the digital twin that we have then applied this, which again, as I said, we have been working with over 20 departments and authorities, we have tried, and again, there are a number of applications or use cases which requires to going to that level of details because in particular, if we wanted to come up with some sort of uh, capabilities, which would provide answers to multiple users rather than one user. And I think this is a new dimension for us to getting into that, to better understand. And it's still, the project is going on and it's still, we are advancing and uh, we are just extending our team uh, with a series of new dimensions. And right now we are also at, uh, applying for another bigger grant uh, again to bring in series of new dimension to tackle over the next uh, three, four years. Okay, question. Thank you. Ah, so you have a question, Charles, please. All right, sure. So my question is to Dr. Mila. I realized that in most of your projects, um, you were dealing with rural landscape. What was the main challenge with the with the, um, reference with rural landscapes and also with the um, the boundary detection algorithm. Did you consider some other algorithms like um, the snake algorithm or the water set segmentation? Why the mean shift 
any particular reason? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me first answer to your first question. Uh, it was due to time limitations, we couldn't, of course, present all our work through all these years because these are a lot of thesis, MSc, PhD thesis passed through that. Uh, but we have basically um, um, explored all possible areas, not only um, rural, we have rural, peri urban, urban areas. Uh, Actually, the automation looks pretty well on the rural areas where we have a uh, uh, nice visible landscape. For example, we had quite successful uh, results in Ethiopia where uh, there are no, cadastre, no digital cadaster and there the parcels were pretty well visible. Uh, but I showed, for example, today Rwanda and also the urban part of Rwanda where it was really challenging. We were trying there really to to challenge ourselves to see what results we will manage to get there. Uh, and this result was promising for urban area where you have a lot of obstacles to extract basically boundaries. Um, so we have variety of results and variety of publications I can share if you want to can see. Uh, and in terms of algorithms, this mean shift segmentation was the very, very first uh, start. I started chronologically today to explain uh, our path that we passed through all these years. It was in the beginning when we had a student that was uh, searching for already developed algorithms with, that he can upgrade and a bit modify not starting from the uh, beginning. That's why he, in his research, he, he was uh, exploring four or five and he reached the, the, in the results uh, of the mean ship that time uh, were outperforming. Actually, this was an Ethiopian student and uh, we got even um, um, Isa third place of competition. Yes, uh, this, he got a, a grant, uh, um, award for that. And then after that, as you have seen, we passed through many other algorithms which were developed commercial and not commercial software. But uh, recently we are trying really to focus more on machine learning where basically we don't use rules, develop rules, and uh, we use the machine which develops itself the rules only based on the data. Right, so by learning, by examples, the computer, the machine develops its own rules for extracting. So we're trying in to, to investigate more into that direction. Yeah, yeah but I hope Mila, I answered your question. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for this. But Mila, I, I think uh, you have some, some very promising results now for, for, from your research and also let's say good perspectives for the future. But did you also work on, let's say, a methodology? Let's say how to how to use those data in the field, or maybe how to use those data as a result from from feature extraction at the central place in the in the village. So, is there already, let's say, a, a working method, or is that the point of future attention? Okay, okay. So the project that I mentioned, Teach for Land, was actually aiming uh, for such results. Uh, so we developed this plugin that was open source and we trained uh, uh, the local community in um, three African countries, but basically in Kenya and Rwanda, it was more successful. Uh, we reached to the point where the local communities uh, can use it. So there were quite some trainings uh, because we tried to make it as easy as possible. The, also in Rwanda, they managed to incorporate our methods and tools in their curriculum in teaching in academia in Ines. Uh, I would say that our research stopped to that level. We couldn't manage to convince the government to for further implementation. And this is kind of a future work because as an output of this project, we also have a startup now, uh, commercial, let's say, for commercialization of this idea. So we have hope that they will further continue our work and they can manage to implement it in reality more and more. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mila. So uh, work to be done. Maybe yeah. my next question, uh, next question uh, for Brent. Yeah, Brent, you were, you were talking about this least uh, squares adjustment uh, uh, functionality where I see many applications to, to bring, uh, let's say field data from, from traditional total stations and, and also GPS antennas, but also the link to, to pixel-based uh, uh, data. So uh, I'm curious, could, could you tell a little bit more? Well, it's a, uh, it's a rigorous engine. Um, okay. Uh, I think the guy who developed the, uh, the least squares engine for, uh, for LINs in New Zealand participated, but it's done, it's le led by, uh, by an Aussie uh, and it's adopted heavily in the Australian community, which as we know, when you work with survey grade cadastral systems and, and adjustments, that's kind of where this new uh, way of handling this comes from. The, uh, the exciting part of it to me is you know, as surveyors, yeah, we know what to do. We, we have yeah. mixed models and different types of data. You know, we, um, in the past, uh, when we adjusted cadastral networks, we couldn't, uh, uh, they were uh, constrained models that were constrained around control. Now we can go constrained or we can let the control float based on uh, the quality of the control position. The most exciting thing to me about this is you can take your data apply the adjustment and, and use it as a quality tool. I think, you know, yeah. as surveyors, yeah, we're going to be like, you know, trying to get to that last centimeter, right? But as cadastral surveyors, the centimeter, um, I, I have, I'm on an advisory committee for a university uh, in their surveying program. And I said, I asked them, are you guys prepared for the uh, the dynamic datums that are coming, which are being adopted now in Australia? And uh, we're a bit delayed in the United States as usual, um, but they'll be coming here. And, and and one of the one of the professors there said, "Yeah, I taught my students how to do this. I went and kicked the pin." So, so, so the uh, although we do try to get that last semi in all practicality, when we manage cadastral data. We want to get the best mathematical representation of the measurements that we have. We, you know, the first question that came up to the group was a really good one. You know, the uh, uh, the physical versus the legal boundaries. Boundaries yeah. are on the ground. You know, mm -hmm. our cadastral systems are representations of those uh, on those yeah. boundaries. Whether we do it from collecting land use, whether we do it from survey, whether we do it from just a sketch map from uncontrolled photography. The quality of our cadastral map will depend on what we can use it for. And the fundamental in the fundamental need of government is taxation. The fundamental need of the landholder is the ability to demonstrate ownership, to convey, to borrow, to mm -hmm. collateralize, right? To be secure in their tenure. Okay, so so the the quality, the survey quality, that's not as necessary, but this is really exciting of the ability to assess how good your cadastral data is. And then, then you know where to go, go spend your, your time in the field to, uh, to improve it. Yeah, Brent, I, I see also another application. We, we have this experience in Colombia, but also in other countries uh, with this participatory uh, surveying grassroots surveyors do the work in the in the field and basically they walk the polygons the perimeters of the the, the, the land and and uh, i see a future application there when it is about maintenance because then then uh, if you split the parcel you can again invite the people maybe they can download uh, an app themselves at home and then they can can walk the let's say the, the polygons of the new parcels, and then this 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 least square adjustment will be uh, uh, very relevant and and can be implemented, I think, in, in an almost hidden uh, way. Yeah, and, and keep in mind this this notion of positional accuracy. Uh, it's always been traditionally, at least, been in the domain of the surveyors and the geodesists. It's no longer solely in their domain. For a few hundred dollars, you can get a GPS and you yeah. can figure this out. 
And if it's a few hundred dollars now, it's going to be $25 in the future. The iPhone 12 has LiDAR in it. Okay. What does this mean? And this is, you know, Peter, think of this. Okay. I go into a property. I go into in, inside a cadastral unit, a building. Poof, I've collected it. Now, how do we take that and then turn that into other things? So this idea of, of measurement, accuracy, and collection, it's, you know, we're, it's exciting to continue to chase. Yeah, uh, super great. 3D models uh, collected via point clouds. A great representation, I fully agree. Yeah. Now that it can be a kind of uh, hidden functionality for grassroots surveyors for Pitfall yeah. cadastral maintenance in the future. That, that is basically what you say, Brent. Yeah, the other thing we've done is we've um, we've done this. Well, our users have done this, um, and we're gonna we're gonna build a workflow for core delivery if we haven't done it yet. But when you take this least squares adjustment, even if you don't adjust your data, you can build a heat map to show the accuracy of your data. You know, where it's where it's really good, where it's not good, and that ties in with some of the things that Mila did. You know, in her. You know, she's exactly the opposite of a typical cadastral system. She's going to be more accurate in the rural areas and less accurate in, at least in the informal settlements where there aren't hedges and walls and, and nice linear features and defined changes in land use to extract. So this mm -hmm. idea to be able, knowing what you have and knowing how to spend your resources to improve it to meet whatever requirements you have and whatever new requirements are coming down the road. That's a pretty exciting part about it. Okay, thank you, baby. The next question for you, uh, Abbas, uh, yeah. when it is about uh, smart cities and digital twins and so on, I think the, the, there is a future with, with, let's say, many, many sensors in, in many, many places everywhere where you go for many purposes and, and, and many reasons. Uh, in my organization, the, the Netherlands Cadastral Land Registry and Mapping Agency, we have ideas to develop a sensor register so that that, is, that, that that you can know as a citizen if you are being censored and, and also for which reason and, and uh, uh, why, why is the organization behind the sensor uh, using those gotcha. sensors or for which purpose and, and so on. And, and that um, because people can can agree also if they like privacy they understand that, that there is a, a, a reason for this uh, uh, but they should be informed so that that means that there should be a kind of a transparency uh, as a service to the to the city yeah. could you bring your view uh, on this great thank you for the excellent questions i think this is a very important aspect of the I mean, our advancement into the technology. In fact, I was actually reading one of the comments that uh, one of the, um, I mean, the attendees uh, put into the system here, indicating that the technology is then also perhaps, I mean, bringing some negative points or affecting to the communities. Yes, you're right. I mean, the elements that what you just raised, it is important with regard to the privacy issues which need to be tackled and also institutional arrangements. And I like the idea of, um, I mean, the I mean, sensors registry to understand and the people then can actually choose that if they really like that those things actually be affected by them or not. So I think there are elements, but unfortunately, again, the, right now we can see more advancement, but then at the same time, more observations on our behavior. And I think this is something that uh, uh, keep coming up in every, uh, I mean, events and uh, the privacies, as well as also accessibility to information. And again, the identity of people. And I think this is another dimension. But yeah. what we actually arrive into, and we're looking for this digital twin and it's still uh, to be resolved related to the level of accessibility of the details uh, that actually can be. I mean, right now, again, those who contributing into the advancement, and they can access to their own um, perhaps their data that being shared. And also they can pick and arrange that who can access to those data sets as well. But at the same time, there are some also, again, the unknown 
challenges as they exist uh, into the system that need to be identified, need to be addressed and improve the system. But look, rather than we eliminating entire, I mean, the opportunities, we have to look at and being aware that actually there might be some other hidden things here we need to understand. And then depending to that, we can set our system that can interact with this. So again, any citizen actually becoming as a sensor into this and interacting with the system. So they should be able to set up themselves that how they would like to be participating or being acting into that sense as an actor. So therefore, we need to also train and provide and also be very clear on this, what they are coming to bonded by, and then they can uh, work on this. But there was also a point that, uh, again, one of the uh, colleagues have asked about that uh, for those countries or jurisdictions that they still don't have 2D cadastre or they are in the 2D environment, what would be the this 3D or uh, digital twin type, I mean, platform benefit. So therefore, I think I've mentioned at one of our slides that the journey, they also the how we are moving from reality into the fully digital and to the digital twin. So it's not just one step actually again, move into that. So there are steps into this advancing the 2D. One thing that I can suggest is, and in fact, our project that we have been working with a number of cases, uh, particularly with also the World Bank and other actually funded project, we keep actually raising this that, I mean, in our design of the 2D, we should bear in mind that we design in such a way that that would actually be also having that capacity that if that jurisdictions tomorrow advancing themselves, moving to the 3D, moving into the other type of capabilities, they are still actually able to do this rather than actually, again, they're just fixing something that then they have to totally actually redesigning everything. And I think there are some dimensions that can be taken care of even at the stage of the 2D. So therefore, we also, I'm a surveyor, licensed surveyor, so I'm not, I totally understand the, again, the, the again, understanding about the amount of work and also requirements. So therefore it's not just a bullet, silver bullet actually just to get this one quickly up, I mean, the jump into that type of environment. You really need to work on this institutional social dimensions of this, and as well as also connectivities between different systems. Otherwise, this is a system not being used. And if it's not used, then you're not really gain anything. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your uh, answer, Abbas. Uh, there's not enough you're time to, to ask for a response from or reply maybe from the other panel members because I have one final, a little bit urgent uh, questions, and, and that is about the uh, encodings. It, it was included a little bit hidden in almost all the presentations, BIM, IFC, uh, but as, uh, and, and uh, city GML and so on. Uh, but when it is about implementation, and if you look to available encodings as land XML, land infra and so on, what would be your, your recommendation when it is about implementation and operationalization of the, the uh, LDM, if you look to available OGC standards? Is LANDM XML a little bit end of life? Maybe people will not like this uh, statement. <laughs> or should we go into a new direction as, as land uh, infra? I would be happy to find your, your reply to this. Uh, Peter, maybe you can if your ideas. Yeah, super interesting question, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm involved in an uh, European project, Horizon 2020, to uh, stimulate the use of uh, the Galileo satellites. They have high accuracy services, so for better um, and more precise surveying. And there are several uh, countries involved. And uh, that we now are investigating how they do uh, submit their surveys from the field to the office. And there is no international standard used in any of these seven countries. And it is Germany, Spain, Italy, uh, and, and four others. Uh, and so in Europe, there, there is no standard. Every country has its own guideline, yeah. 
national standard. And yeah, somehow I think this is not good for the all the involved actors, not for the surveyors, not for the manufacturers of survey equipment, not for the software companies like uh, ESRI and others, not for the uh, yeah, national mapping and cadastral agencies. Uh, it costs them all more money. It is inefficient and, and not flexible. But OK, then uh, where is the standard for the encoding of cadastral surveys? Uh, that is accepted by the uh, global community. Yeah. That is uh, a good question. And, uh, OK. Uh, I think from uh, this project I am now involved, uh, it's called GISCAT OV, GISCAT, Galileo. Uh, improved services to cadastral surveys. Uh, they will try to promote in the seven European countries a standard. And uh, the CLGE is uh, trying to convince the yeah. surveyors that they will adopt the standard. Uh, and hopefully uh, when you start with seven countries and they really do so, uh, that's a start and other countries may follow. Uh, I have no clue how the standard will look like, the encoding standard. <laughs> okay, yeah, Abbas, really, I, I promise to be your, your time manager, and I like to keep my promises because I know this is a very relevant uh, discussion, and I'm really sure, and I invite you to, to, to join those discussions in Open Geospatial Consortium and uh, uh, also ISO TC211, uh, because there are, there are really many, many uh, options here. And, and I think we need to find, uh, we need to find agreement, uh, given the developments as we did find them in, in your presentations. So thank you for your contributions. Uh, I like to, to close the sessions. It was really uh, exciting to be here in this uh, session with all the perspectives. Uh, I would like to, to thank uh, my rapporteur uh, and uh, the, the, the technical facilitators, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things are happening here <laughs> behind the, the screens. So thank you for your fantastic uh, contributions and for your support. I close the session. Wherever you are. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, good evening. Thank you, thank you all the presenters. Well done. Thank you, Chris, okay. for sharing. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Daniel, thank you. Good thank morning. Wherever you are. Bye-bye. Wherever you are, good evening, good night, good morning, <laughs> good afternoon. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Yeah.